Our Father God, we thank you for this day that you have given us that we can set aside, Father, to come into your house. And Father, on this special day, we remember those who gave their lives that we might live free. And Father, help us to remember and to, to be thankful for the freedom that we do have. And the responsibility is ours, Father, as we can come into this house and to listen to your word and to sing our songs and to fellowship with one another with no fear. And Father, there are those who are all over the world who do not share this freedom. And oh, Father, we ask that you would be with them and strengthen them today. Oh, Father, our hearts go out to them and ask that you give us wisdom how to pray for these people, Father, and how to intercede for them. Be with us, Father, as we come to this point where your word becomes our center focus, that it might, Father, have a means in which to enter into our hearts and to change our lives, to encourage us and to strengthen us that we might be more like Jesus. For it is in Jesus' precious and holy name we pray. Amen. Thank you. you may be seated. Let's open our Bibles to the book of Genesis, Genesis chapter 21. And as you are turning, every time I sing that song, I can't help but to think of a sweet lady that I met in Florida who was in a nursing home. And uh, Dr. Lindsay had had a heart attack. And the first Sunday he had come back from his heart attack, he gave a special message on how God had come to him, literally and visited him in his room, and uh, told him that uh, his surgery was going to go well. He had a heart valve replacement after his heart attack, and told him how the Lord had come into his room and told him he was going to have about 10, 11 years more to, to work for him. But as he, he shared that message, of course, we were live on television Unbeknownst to him, in a little nursing home, there was a little old lady in her 80s who was blind, who they had maneuvered into the, the room where the TV was, and she was able to hear the, uh, the message of Dr. Lindsay. And after the message, of course, they gave an altar call on the TV, and uh, uh, she began shouting. They couldn't keep her to shut up. Uh, I got, I'm saved, I'm saved. And, and uh, basically they called us the next morning, please, could you come by and shut this woman up? And, and so I went over to see her and talked with her. And of course, she was at the age she could not be baptized. But I shared with her the best I could. And, and I began to read this, this uh, song to her. I had it in my Bible. And, and she said, would you sing that for me? And I said, sure, I'd love to. So I sang the song to her, just her and me. We had our own little private church service. And it was about two weeks later, she died. And I thought, what, a, what an opportunity to be on the to television, to have a woman who was blind, who could not read the Bible, but yet hear the Word of God and be saved from a television ministry and to be able to minister to her until she went home to be with the Lord. What, what a blessing. So every time I hear that song, I think of that sweet lady as we sat in that little old room, her in her wheelchair, me on the side of the bed, and we, were, she was listening and I was singing. Bless her heart, probably sent her home early, but anyway. <laughs> we never know, you know. Last week we were with Hagar and Ishmael. Ishmael had, had basically acquired his mother's personality of, of arrogance. And Sarah, seeing what that was going to do to Isaac, uh, talked with Abraham, and Abraham, she told Abraham, let's send the, the two away. Abraham, of course, was very despondent. This was his son. He didn't know what to do. And God intervened and spoke to Abraham and said, this is okay. Allow them to leave, and I will bless Ishmael. I will give him, you know, 12 sons will be, son, uh, be princes. And I'll take care of him. So Abraham did. It was a hard thing for Abraham to do, I'm sure. But we have to understand that Isaac is the chosen one. And we talked about that last week, what, what it meant to be a chosen one. Why it was chosen? Because he was the chosen one to continue the seed. We went all the way back to Genesis chapter 3. We talked about how God had promised there in the garden with Eve that a, her seed would be of her seed would be the Redeemer. 
would be the Messiah would come and that he would overcome the evil one and they would be able to bring them back to the way it should be. And so every child that was born, every son that was born was literally seen as perhaps this will be the seed, this will be the one. And so from Adam to to uh, Seth and from Seth to Noah and from Noah uh, to, to uh, Shem and all the way down it came to Abraham. And so we have this thought about, okay, who was the chosen one? How do we know it was Isaac rather than Ishmael? Well, as I shared with you last week, look at the life of the two men. Ishmael became a wild man, so to speak. Isaac became a man after God. We see through Ishmael, we came all the way down into the, to the aspect of Muhammad who, who gave us Islam, who gave us a, a religion that was literally a religion of death, a religion that would want us to die, a religion that would, would kill people, a religion that would cause them to strap bombs to their bodies and blow themselves up, whereas Isaac brought us Jesus, who gave us eternal life, who said, I don't want you to die for me, I want you to live for me. So there was the difference as we talked about how we knew for certain that Isaac was the chosen seed because you see it went from Isaac to Jacob to Israel who became Israel and these 12 sons and to Judah and all the way down the line to David and to Solomon all the way down the line to Jesus. And we talked about that chosen seed and we see how why God allowed this to be separated. God will bless Ishmael, and he does bless Ishmael. And what he does with that will be his own accounting with the Lord. One day, the, the sons of Ishmael will have to give an account of the Lord. They'll have to give an account to God, as every individual does, by the way. But these sons of Ishmael will have to give an account to the Lord why they chose Muhammad over Jesus. You know, they say Jesus was, was just anybody else. They said that God had no sons. And so they are literally rejecting the chosen seed of Isaac. And by doing so, they have damned themselves to hell. It's a sad, tragic thing. It wasn't that way supposedly in the beginning. Now we're going to see Abraham today in, in this following this chapter of 21. And Abraham is going to be a blessing. Somebody very unique is going to come back into Abraham's life. And as he comes back into Abraham's life, he's going to ask for a blessing. He's going to ask for a covenant with Abraham. There are stipulations for that. Not just anybody can come to God's people and say, I want to be in covenant with you and with your God. There has to be things that have to be done. We're going to see that today. But we see here in the life of Abimelech, once more he's going to be coming in to the life of Abraham. Let's start with, <clears throat> excuse me, verse 22. <clears throat> and it came to pass at that time that Abimelech and Phicol, the commander of his army, spoke to Abraham saying, God is with you in all that you do. Now therefore swear to me by God that you will not deal falsely with me, with my offspring or with my posterity, but that according to the kindness that I have done to you, you will do to me and to the land in which you have dwelt. And Abram said, I will swear. And then Abram rebuked Abimelech because of the well of water which Abimelech's servants had seized. And Abimelech said, I do not know who has done this thing. You did not tell me, nor have I heard of it until today. So Abraham took sheep and oxen and gave them to Abimelech, and the two of them made a covenant. And Abraham set seven ewe lambs of flock by themselves. Then Abimelech asked Abraham, What is the meaning of these seven ewe lambs which you have set by themselves? And he said, You will take these seven ewe lambs from my hand, that they may be my witness that I have dug this well. Therefore he called the place Beersheba, because the two of them swore an oath there. Thus they made a covenant at Beersheba. So Abimelech rose with Phicol, the commander of his army, and they returned to the land of the Philistines. Then Abraham planted a tamarisk tree in Beersheba and there called on the name of the Lord, the everlasting God. And Abraham stayed in the land of the Philistines many days. We see here, first of all, the request of Abimelech. Now, there is a question by many of the, of the commentators 
Jewish and, and uh, Gentile, where they ask the question, is Abimelech a name or is it a, a position? For example, like they talk about when Abraham went down into Egypt or when Isaac goes in, into Egypt or when they went down to Egypt, they used the term Pharaoh. That's a title. That's not a name. So there are many people who believe that Abimelech is a title. There are two men in the biblical uh, text in the Old Testament, uh, in, in the Gentiles that have the name Abimelech. One later on will come in Isaac's life. And there are three that are Jewish by nature who are later on uh, in the Old Testament text. But there are many people who believe that this Abimelech is a title. It literally means uh, the father of the king, or it means the king, God, is my father. It's got a double meaning. It can mean the father of the king, or it can mean God is my father. Or God is my God, the King is my Father. So we see here that that He has a a man who comes into His life that is a very important person. He brings with Him His general of His forces. So this is not an average everyday meeting. This is not a tea around the table. Arab people love tea, by the way. If you ever go over in the Middle East, they they will they will provide tea with you, and and they're very very gracious in doing that. They will provide you with tea and sometimes with a little cookie or two. Uh, but the bottom line is they like to do that. But this isn't one of those times. Abimelech is bringing his general as a verification of what's going on. We're getting a treaty here, a covenant between Abraham and Abimelech and Abraham's God. We're going to see here in verse 22 through 24 the pagan's plea of the prophet. Now, Abimelech is from the peoples of the Philistines. Now, the Canaanites in that area, there were many, many tribes of people who were all lumped into this group called the Canaanites, and the Philistines were one of those. The Philistines, they believe, came from Egypt, went to, uh, to Cyprus, and eventually, or to Crete, and eventually came back down into the area known as Gaza area or, or the Lebanon area uh, in, in northern Israel. And there they, they were seagoing people, and they were people who populated the coastline of Israel, who literally became their enemies later on. They literally became their enemies uh, to the point that David and, and Solomon, and even in the ju- time of the judges, they fought them for, for generations. But anyway, we see this acknowledgement of, of Abraham's position. Look at verse 22. This king comes, and he's not coming to do battle, but look at verse 20. It came to pass at the time that Abimelech and, and Phicol, the commander of his army, spoke to Abraham, saying, God is with you in all that you do. Now, that's an interesting thing, because the last time we see Abimelech, Abimelech has Sarah in his harem, and Abraham's uh, uh, keeping quiet about it, and God comes to a dream in this, to this pagan king and says, Look, if you don't give this man's wife back to him, I'm going to kill you. Your women are going to be barren for the rest of their life, and you'll never have a progeny. So the bottom line is you either do this or die. Of course, Abimelech was scared to death. What have you done to me? Why are you doing this? You know, and and Abraham basically said, hey, you know, I was afraid you were going to kill me, and she is my half-sister after all, you know, and he tried to reconcile it. But see, Abimelech now has had time to look at Abraham. He said, time to observe him. You remember, it wasn't like the Egyptians. When Abraham did that to the Egyptians, the Egyptian says, get out of here. We don't even want you here. Look, take this the gold and silver and take our flocks and our servants, and you just get out of here. Just leave us alone. In fact, the next time Abraham's people go down to Egypt, they, they literally became slaves eventually. But what we have here is Abimelech said, look, here's my, here's my flock, here's my servants, you can have them. And you can stay in the land. You can go anywhere you want to because God had told him, Abraham's a prophet. You might need him to pray for you. In fact, if you do what I ask you to do, he will pray for you and you will be healed. So Abimelech here is, is, has been watching Abraham and he's been noticing something different here. Notice that he is aware of Abraham's special relationship with God. 
You see, God came to him in a dream and said to him, Abimelech, this is my prophet. And so he's been noticing. He's been standing afar back. Now, folks, people at work sometimes are going to stand afar back and watch you. They're going to see. They're going to know you're not perfect. You know, people know you and I aren't perfect. Uh, you, you think you, you put off an air or whatever. You think people think, well, they know you're not perfect. Okay, so let's just put that on the table right now. We understand we're not perfect. But what we need to understand is people need to see God in your life. They need to understand that. We had a family that lived across the street from us for years in Florida. Now, I didn't bring a big, huge family Bible over every afternoon and bump them on the head. I didn't put a big sign in my front yard, pagans, we're Christians. You know, I didn't do anything like that. In fact, they got saved many years after we left the neighborhood. And here's what they said to us. We watched you. We saw you, how you dealt with your children. We saw you when you got up every Sunday morning and Sunday night, went to church on Wednesday night. We watched your life. We saw what went on. We saw on Sundays you didn't let your children go out and play. You had them stay inside. We watched all of that, and we said, we want what you have. And they got saved. Now, folks, again, they knew I wasn't perfect. But you see, that's what God asks us to do. Not only to have words about God, but to have works about God. Now, again, you don't have to get up and put a big sticker on your chest and say, Hi, I'm John. I'm a born-again Christian. And aren't you glad? Or aren't, don't you wish you were one, too? You don't have to do that. Or balloons flying from your house. But to just live like God is with you. And that's what Abraham did. And he watched him and he said, There's something unique about this man. He said, Everything you do. Look again at verse, verse 22. He says, God is with you in all that you do. Everything you did is about God, he said, as a prophet of God. Again, Genesis 27 says, Now therefore restore the man's wife, for he is a prophet, and he will pray for you, God said. Do you know they understand you will pray for them? If you haven't already had it work, somebody may come and ask you, Would you pray for me? We've had people all our lives say, Would you pray for me? You know, and, and, you know, I don't go around putting pastor on my label or anything like that. I, you know, I, the only reason why I tell people I'm a pastor, if I'm a plane, I don't want to talk to the person. You know, if, I'm, if, if I want to talk to people, I'm a public speaker. If I don't want to talk to anybody, I'm a pastor, so leave me alone. <laughs> that usually shuts them up right away, you know, anyway. But he's a prophet of God. And then we see a pre he's pre preferenced by God. God is with you in all that you do. He told Abraham, God told Abraham in Genesis 12, 3, I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you, and in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. Abimelech is seeing this. He's watching this, folks. And he's saying, I want something that you have. Look at verse 23, his appeal for Abraham's promise. Now, therefore, swear to me by God that you will not deal falsely with me, with my offspring or with my posterity, but that according to the kindness I have done to you, you will do to me and to the land in which you have dwelt. What he's saying is, I don't want you to go back doing what you did before. Would you please, I've watched you and I know you're a good man. Would you please live with me as, as a Christian or as a man of God? And we see a covenant with himself personally here in verse 23. He says, I want you to swear to me by God. So I want you to deal with me. I want you to get in with a, with a covenant with me. He wants this personally with him. And then he says, not only that, with my offspring and with my posterity. He has a covenant with his posterity. He says, I want you to covenant with me and my family. You see, that's very important. This would be a great Father's Day message, that a father would go to the people of God and say, I want your God. And I want my family to have him too. This would be a great Father's Day message. It didn't work it out that way for me. But the whole bottom line is family and friends, we need to go to God and say, I want to make a covenant with you. I want to make a covenant with you. We had a man who came by our home all the time before my parents split up. 
His name was Cliff Nesserol. Cliff has been dead for many years. Cliff got saved in prison, became a, became a Quaker, Quaker minister. He was a, uh, basically what you call a, 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 uh, a minister, just a, an itinerant minister. He, he never had a church and wasn't a pastor, but he just preached different places. But he was a Quaker, and he'd become a very, very humble man. And he used to come and pray for my family. And he would come and pray for my dad, and he would pray for my mom, and then he would pray for us. And I can remember Cliff because I'd always peek. I'd never met a man who prayed like Cliff when I was that young. And I always peeked and watched him pray. I wondered what people looked like when they were talking to God, you know. And he'd always squint his eyes, and his, he had a bald head in his forehead, and his head would turn red. And I used to think, man, that's what it's like to, to talk with God. Man, that must be some, some, you know, real interesting, powerful stuff. But anyway, Cliff was a very unique person in that he prayed for my mother. He, he sowed a lot of seed before my parents got saved. And I know he had a lot to do with it, to be very honest with you. But you see, God has a way of bringing people in the lives of other people that people will say, I want what you have. I want your God. And you see, that's why God places you there. That's why you have the sphere of influence that you have. You say, well, I don't have kings in my sphere of influence. Well, neither do I. But we have a sphere of influence. It might be our own family. It might be our children. It might be our grandchildren. It can be our nephews and our nieces. It can be any of these people that we have a sphere of influence that our family looks at us and says, I want what you have. But listen to me very carefully. There are also other people at work that want what you have, perhaps. So we see this, this man who is appealing for this promise. This covenant, by the way, lasted all the way up to Samson. When Samson became a judge, his primary target was the Philistines. And part of that probably was Samson's uh, dislike for the Philistines as he had a, had a personal a animosity to them, but they also had an animosity at that time for the children of Israel. Sometimes, folks, the covenant we make with God does not give us a guarantee that our family down the line are going to be Christians. Dr. Lindsay, my pastor, used to say it this way, we're only one generation away from paganism. It's not automatic that we pass it down, is it? We see this covenant lasted for quite some time. In verse 25 and 26, we see the prophet's problem with the pagan. We see the pagan's plea of the prophet, but now we see the prophet's problem with a pagan. Look at verse 25, Abraham's dispute with trouble. Abraham brings something up. Now, why would you do this, Abraham? This man has come to you and asking for a special favor. Here's an opportunity, Abraham, that he's going to do. Why are you going to get picky and say, I got a problem with you before we make this deal? Is he just splitting hairs, folks? Look at verse, look at verse 25. At verse 25, then Abraham rebuked Abimelech. You see, Abimelech earlier had rebuked Abraham and said, you're not, at, you're not doing fair with me. Abraham now is rebuking Abimelech because of a problem. We see the confrontation over Abraham's sovereignty. He says, I got a problem here. He says, what's your problem? Look at verse again, verse 25. Because of a well of water which Abimelech's servants had seized. Folks, water was extremely important. Especially in the desert. Beersheba is down near the desert. And Abraham said, I dug that well. That is my well you have no right to it, and you've come and you've seized it. And I want it back. Now, here's a man who basically overcame all kinds of generals and battles that even the king of Sodom and the king of Salem came down and bowed down to him and asked, what can we do for you? But the bottom line is Abraham here has let this happen, and he's come to this king, and he said, because you paid me a favor, I didn't want to say this, but now that you want to enter a covenant with me, I want to talk about this. Now, here's the issue. Anytime you get into a covenant, anytime you enter into a covenant with God, everything must be settled. We'll talk about that in just a few seconds. But you cannot enter into God's covenant with 
things in the past that is going to cause trouble. You have to settle everything before you get with God, and we'll talk about it in a second. We see the confrontation of Abraham's sovereignty. This is my well, but we see the confiscation of Abimelech's servants. They took his well. They had no right to it. So what was Abraham doing? First of all, he was testing Abimelech's sincerity. Do you really want to enter with me in the covenant? Then if you do, you'll give me back my well. Abraham was saying, look, if you really want to enter the covenant with me and with my God, which is a part of that covenant, then you're going to have to square up here and do something. We see in verse 26, Abimelech's denial of treachery. Abimelech shows his, his ignorance of the details. In verse 26, he says, I, I do not know what's do, who's done this, and you did not tell me, nor have I heard of it and, until today. He said, I don't know about this. You know, I genuinely believe he's sincere about it. I have not read anything else where he wasn't. I read one commentator said, well, he was just blowing smoke, but I, don't, I honestly don't think so. I think, you know, you don't know everything all your servants are doing. When you're the king or you're in, you don't know everything that's going on. You know, you're usually the last person to know what's going on in your family, aren't you? The bottom line is, he had no clue what was going on. He was ignorant of the details, and he was innocent of the deed. He had no idea. One of his group, one of his people, were, were, have this on the side. So when they're in that area, they could water their flock, so to speak. Again, there is no biblical ev evidence that he was, was not telling the truth. You see, all that matters, all the matters of sin and harm must be dealt with before you can enter into a covenant with God. You see, he wasn't just entering into a covenant with Abraham. He was entering a covenant with Abraham and Abraham's God. And all these matters must be dealt with. The New Testament calls it repentance. God, I want to be saved. God, I want to enter into the new covenant with you. God said, that's wonderful. Everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. But what do you have to do before you call on the name of the Lord? You have to recognize that He is a Savior. Which if, he, if He's a Savior, it's the Son of God and the Savior, then you have to recognize you're a sinner. And the reason why He came was to save you from your sins. And you have to recognize not only that, but you have to repent of your sins. Confess them and repent them. And here's what Abraham was doing. Before you can enter into this special covenant, you have to repent. You have to recognize and repent. Now, folks, that's, that's the way any covenant is, and it's the way with the new covenant it is today. The new covenant has the same thing. Galatians 3, 7 says, Therefore know that only those who are, are of faith are sons of Abraham. You know, the bottom line is, folks, unless we have faith in the act of God as the Redeemer and, and, and to redeem we sinners, is the only way we can get into the new covenant. Abimelech's denial of treachery was real, but he still had a problem, and he needed to repent of it. So we see the request of Abimelech. Abraham saying, okay, if you want to get into this you know, covenant, you're going to have to, to do some things. And just like the new covenant that God brought into us through Jesus Christ, we have to be aware that there is something we must do. Not that we are saved by our works. I'm not saying that. The Bible specifically says that it's an act of gra faith through grace, or it's grace through faith and not of, of works. So we cannot say that this is of works, basically saying you wanting to do this, this is what you have to do. So we see the response of Abraham in verse 27 through 34. First of all, he confirms his pact. In verse 27, look at the covenant for Abimelech. Really, this is two covenants. He makes a covenant for Abimelech in verse 27. So Abraham took sheep and oxen and gave them to Abimelech, and the two of them made a covenant. We see the sign of the consensus. Abraham has an opportunity to bless Abimelech as he had done to him. Remember? Abraham failed. Abraham lied. Abraham had done something to Abimelech. Abimelech, in turn, rather than harm him, rather than hurt him, rather than abuse him, took him and blessed him, gave him the sheep, the oxen, and gave him servants. Genesis 20, 14 says, Then Abimelech took sheep, oxen, and male and female servants and gave them to Abraham, and he restored Sarah, his wife, to him. Now, did you notice what's missing? Note what was missing. Abraham did not give him people. He gave him back his sheep, gave him back his oxen, 
but he didn't give back people. Why is that? Because Abraham was leading people to God, not to other people or to, to godless people. Abraham was leading people to him, just like, like uh, God had asked him to do. He was taking those servants, and every one of those servants, it was better to be a slave in Abraham's camp than to be a heathen king someplace else. I mean, even the Pharaoh, some, the Jewish commentators said the Pharaohs, they believed that Hagar, whom they had given to Abraham as a servant, was one of the daughters of Pharaoh. And that's why Hagar had a hard time with this whole thing because she had, been grown, had grown up as royalty. And she had a hard time submitting to Sarah and submitting to Abraham. And Abraham had to excuse her for a while. We'll talk about her in a couple weeks down the road. But Hagar was, was the Pharaoh thought, it's better my daughter be a slave in the house of God than to be a, sir, to be a, a, a princess in, in the country, in the, in the world of, of pagandry. We see here, folks, he didn't give back the, the people. Then we see their sincere cooperation. The Bible says, and the two of them made a covenant. How can you make a covenant unless two agree? Amos 3.3 3 says, how can two walk together unless they are agreed? How can that happen? Unless two people agree, there's no covenant. Aren't you glad that there was a covenant giver? That when you got saved, there was one who said, I want to save you. And there was another, your party, my party, that said, I want to be saved. And God said, I'll save you and give you eternal life. Now I want you to walk and live for me. And you said, I'll do that. I didn't understand all what that meant, but I didn't know what I meant to be saved. I was 11 years old, for goodness sake. I didn't understand everything. But as I've walked with God, God has revealed himself to me through his word, down through my life, and I have known what that covenant has been more and more as I've grown in the Lord. And as you've grown in the Lord, you've understand what the Lord has wanted of you and expected of you and had for you down your life, down the pathway of your life. Sometimes we've taken side, side trips We've taken a side road, a detour sometimes, and God waits there, waiting for us to come back like the prodigal son, waiting to come back to the father's house, waiting to come back where we left so that we can start all over again down the road. And we've all done that. But God does expect us to follow him and to love him and care for him. Abraham made an agreement with Abimelech. We see the sign of the consensus and the sincere cooperation. Look at verse 28 through 30, the covenant for Abraham. Abraham said, okay, Abimelech, I've made a covenant with you. Now I want you to make one with me. How's that? Look at verse 28 through 30. And by the way, our covenant is twofold too. Not only have I made a covenant with God, when I got saved, God said, I'm going to save you, son. I'm going to give you eternal life. And I said, that's wonderful. I can't wait to be saved. And I got saved the very first time I felt the Holy Spirit's drawing. I went. And God made a covenant with me. And now I was to make a covenant with him. And we see this twofold covenant. This covenant is for Abraham. What does he say? Look at verse 28, Abram's presentation. We see in verse 28, the Bible says simply, And Abram said, Seven ewe lambs by the flock by themselves. Seven ewe lambs right over there. And, and Abimelech says in verse 29, what are these guys doing here? That's strange. How did you do that? But in verse 28, we see Abraham's presentation. Seven ewes. Seven, by the way, is the number of completion. Abraham has an idea. Look at Abimelech's puzzlement. In verse 28, uh, 20, uh, 29, then Abimelech asked Abraham, what is the meaning of these seven ewes which you have set by themselves? And Abraham in verse 30, I'm glad you asked. <laughs> Look at verse 30, Abraham's proposal. And he said, you will take these seven ewe lambs from my flock, from my hand, that they may be my witness that I have dug this well. Why lambs? Why not goats? Why not, why not donkeys? Why not camels? Why not cattle? Why lambs? You see, a Gentile enters into a covenant with a Jew by a lamb. We enter into the covenant with Abraham by a lamb. 
the lamb that John the Baptist pointed to one day and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Why seven? It was completion. It was, there was nothing more needed. Why a lamb? Because there was a lamb down the road for us that as a good little old Gentile boy who wanted to get a part of a Jewish covenant that I would have to become a spiritual son of Abraham by accepting the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. We see here Abimelech's, or Abraham's proposal. Abraham was very wise indeed. It secured the recognition of Abraham's right to the land. It secured Abraham's recognition of his right to be the chosen seed of God. And Abimelech recognized it. And this little Gentile boy recognized it too. So that by me recognizing that seed coming all the way down through the line, through Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, finally all the way down to David and to Solomon, all the way down to Jesus, that I can be saved by the Lamb of God set aside for me that I might enter into the covenant. We see here the covenant of Abraham for Abraham. In verse 31 and 32, the covenant's formally accomplished. Look at verse 31. The Bible says very simply here, therefore he called the place Beersheba. Or really it can be, it can be pronounced Beersheba. Beersheba means the oath, uh, excuse me, the well of the oath. Beer being well and Sheba being oath. Or it can be pronounced, which many of the Jewish people pronounce it, Beersheba, Shiva, which is seven, the oath of seven. And see, what we have here is the oath of Beersheba is not the oath of Abimelech's oath that he got with him, the covenant, but it's Abraham's covenant in the aspect that it's the oath of the sheep. And he called it Beersheba, the oath or the well of the oath or the well of the sheep or the seven, excuse me, that it can be a place of agreement. Beersheba was this well and you can go there today. In fact, the other day we were watching a DVD in the, in the back room and the guy walked right up to the, the well at Beersheba. There he says, this is the well. Now, they had built something on top of it so it would protect it, but you could look down and drink that same water that was in the well that Abraham had dug. What a fascinating thing. We had done the same thing when we'd gone to Israel when we went to the, the Jacob's well. Went to Jacob's well and drank the same water that Jacob's well had dug for his well. These patriarchs were digging wells, folks, and the wells were a focal point in the lives of the family to always understand this is our land. And when the, finally the lady came to, to Jesus there at the Jacob's well and said, let me get you some water, and Jesus said, wait, wait, let me, let me give you water. Let me give you water from this well that will last for eternity. And oh, she said, where is this water? I, I would love to drink this water. I know the Messiah is coming. And Jesus said, I am he. And he said, if you drink of this water, you'll never go thirsty again. Folks, we've been to the well. And we've got the covenant with the Lamb. And we have the everlasting promise that we will never be thirsty again as long as we love God and live for him. We see here, folks, the, a place of their agreement. But look at verse 32, the parting of Abimelech. He departed a partner in the journey with Abraham. He didn't go away the same. He came in for a fearful man, bringing his general with him and literally coming, but he par departed a partner with Abraham's journey. Abram had made an allowance and got, uh, and got his will back. It was a good thing. It was a good thing. And then what happens with Abraham? Look at verse 33 and 34. He conducts his praise. We see here that, that not only he confirms his pact, but he conducts his praise. In verse 33, look at the reverence of Abraham. We see the symbolism of his witness in verse, in verse, 30, verse 33. Then Abraham planted a tamarisk tree in Beersheba. 
Now, many of the Jewish commentators say that this tamarisk tree was literally a fruit tree and that Abraham had planted fruit trees around this area so that when people came to the well, they could also have the fruit. You know, when you come to the well and you come to know the lamb, you ought to bear fruit in your life. As a Christian, we ought to bear fruit, folks, everywhere we go. And Abraham built placed that tree there that he might have witness of bearing fruit in his life. And so that everyone who came to the well said, oh, not only do I have Jesus as my Savior, but I've got the fruit of his love and his grace in my life. We see the symbol of his witness. Abraham planted a tamarisk tree and look at the site of his worship. And there he called on the name of the Lord, the everlasting God. Oh, thank God for the everlasting covenant of the well. Thank God for the everlasting covenant of the Lamb. Thank God for the everlasting covenant of the Lamb and the well so that we can bear everlasting fruit throughout all eternity. We see this. It was once more that Abraham acknowledges the true God. He introduces another name for God, the everlasting God, Jehovah El Olam. Jehovah is the everlasting God. And through Abraham had just made, though Abraham had just made a covenant with an earthly king, he acknowledges an eternal covenant with God. He says, God, I've, I've, I remember you and your covenant. And this covenant that I've entered into, I thank you that other people want to enter into it too. And oh, Abraham became a soul winner. You see, that's part of the fruit. He said, tell people about the covenant with God. Let people see God in your life that they might say, I want what you got. And look at the repose of Abraham in verse 34. He was sojourning in the land of the pagans. Notice it didn't say that he dwelt there, in, meaning he stayed there forever. Look at verse 34 again. And Abraham stayed in the land of the Philistines. Now that stay in the King James Version is the word sojourn. And that word stay there in the Greek, or excuse me, the Hebrew literally means for a short time. That he just resided there for a short time. It wasn't a long time. The land of the Canaan, the Canaanites were still in, their, in, the, in the land. There's a majority of people there. Abraham sojourned. Why? Because he was searching for the land of promise. What do you mean, preacher? Hebrews, the 11th chapter, verse 9 and 10 says this, By faith he dwelt in the land of promise, speaking of Abraham, as in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs of him of the same promise. For he waited for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Folks, we're dwelling in Canaan land. We're just passing through. We're just sojourning here. The tents that you put down might look a little different than the tents that Abraham put down. The camels you ride may look a little different than the camels that Abraham rode. The wells that we dig may look a little different than the wells that Abraham dug. But folks, we're just pilgrims passing through. We don't reside here. This isn't our world. This isn't our country. This isn't our land. We're just passing through. Oh, folks, listen, plant some trees along the way. Dig some wells, yes, but always remember we're just passing through. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your word. And Father, more especially at this time of decision, we thank you, Father, for the Holy Spirit who teaches us, who speaks to our heart, Father, and gives us the message of the hour that we might fill our heart to overflowing. And as the psalmist, Father, say, our cup is running over. Oh, Father God, let us be like Abraham who sojourned for just a short time, but looking for that city whose maker and builder was God. Oh, Father God, be with us today. If there's anyone here, visitor or even church member, Father, for some reason come to understand they're not saved, let them come and take me by the hand. We'll show them in the Bible how to be saved. And Father, there might be someone sojourning right now and they have an Abimelech in their life and they want to be able to share uh, the truth and to dig wells and to, to bear fruit. Oh, Father God, give them an opportunity to come and pray 
whatever decision needs to be made before we leave this place, let it be done today. For it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hi, my name is John Blair, and I have the privilege of being the pastor here at Coventry Baptist Church in Fort Wayne, Indiana. I want to thank you for choosing to take part in our online services. I sincerely hope they were a blessing to you, and I want to invite you to continue to use them in the weeks yet ahead. In fact, take your time on our website, check it out, let us know what you think about it. Your opinion is very important to us, and we'd like to have some feedback. Let me take this time to also extend an invitation to you. If you don't already have a church home, let me invite you to come to our church and take part in one of our weekly services. Our morning worship service on Sunday is at 10 a.m. Our Sunday night service is at 6 p.m. And our Wednesday services and our midweek service is at 7 o'clock p.m. We're located at 10926 Aboit Center Road. We're right across the street from Homestead High School. Uh, just get on our website. We have a detailed map and some instructions on how to get here. Again, thank you for choosing our website and our services. I pray that the Lord will bless you and keep you. I hope to see you this Sunday.